hundred years of toing and froing. Newport Transporter Bridge. It's been the heart of the town for a century, and it's still going strong. There are only seven other transporters left in the world. This is the largest and the most elegant. Well, I think it's a magnificent structure, brilliant structure. You'll never see the like of it again, and it is a wonderful, wonderful design and a wonderful building. So I hope it's there for another hundred years. Oh, the thrill of walking up the steps and walking over the top, I couldn't believe it. I don't know what it is, it's just magic inside me. And I've always been in love with the bridge. The gondola glides across the River Usk at 10 feet a second. It's one of Wales' top attractions. It's even starred in the movies. And this is where I come in. I spent a long cold night on the bridge when I was only 12. Now the transporter has a very special place in my heart. And today she's exactly 100 years old. So here's her story. Okay, 50p please. Thank you very much. It's a living, working sculpture, carrying nearly 500 cars and a thousand pedestrians across the River Ask every week. Now a Grade One listed monument, powered electrically, it's made of two and a half thousand tons of steel, and it's held together with more than a million rivets. High above the passengers, maintenance is underway the old-fashioned way. Well, I think it's a marvellous structure, but it's, um, well, for any era, really, but, you know, especially for the early part of the century. It's 242 feet high, high enough to accommodate the tall ships sailing up the Usk at the turn of the century. Much of the maintenance is the same as a hundred years ago, with a big stick and a bucket of grease. Just greasing the inner rail now. Uh, we do it about twice a week. And I'll be doing the outer one shortly. And the inner one on the far side. Okay, John, all clear to go. The steel must have been good. I mean, it, it, I would hate to think anything structure that's as old as this, it, or will be this old in a hundred years' time, that's pretty wearing as well as this one has. It's quiet now, but in the 1890s, this was a busy, thriving port, with coal pouring in from the Gwent Valleys by rail, and then shipped around the globe. With plentiful water, fuel and labour, Newport was an ideal place for heavy industry. And one wealthy industrialist had his eye on the town. John Lysett's group of steel from Wolverhampton, they had a, a large factory up there, very successful. They were looking for a site in South Wales and they thought, well, near Newport would be a good place to, to go to. Uh, they were looking around and of course they realised that there was no bridges down near the site where they actually ended up and so they uh, approached the council and said, can anything be done? Oh, well, we've thought about this for a number of years. The council knew they had to conquer the treacherous River Usk and were determined to win the steelworks for the town. Borough engineer Robert Haynes had heard of an innovative aerial ferry in Rouen in France, so he took a council delegation out to see it and right to the top. They went over to France to see uh, a version over there. They fell in love with it and said, right, let's go ahead. 
So French designer Ferdinand Arnaudin, a contemporary of Gustave Eiffel, drew up designs for Newport's very own transporter bridge. They were completed in 1901, and once they'd managed to convert the plans from metric to imperial, work began the following year. I think it was hard work and I think it was dangerous. Men travelled hundreds of miles looking for work, and there was plenty to be found in the ports of South Wales. They didn't have the tools when it was built like they've got now. It must have been really hard work for them. That's how I, what I think of the bridge, and I think of it now. Iris's father, Ernest Waggett, was one of the workers. With a wife and growing family, he settled in Newport as the bridge took shape. Well, I thought it was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And I used to think, to think my father helped to build that. You know, you stand back and you think about it, to think my father. And all I've got is a memory. On September the 12th, 1906, the bridge was finally opened by Viscount Tredegar. Hundreds looked on in the rain as the gondola travelled on its first trip from the west bank of the Usk to the east and back again. The bridge had cost £98,000 to build. Among that very first transporter crew was young Jim Evans. He started work when he was 11 as the tea boy, you know, and then he gradually moved on and on till he got... But his father also was a painter on the bridge, so they worked together. 400,000 people used the transporter bridge in its first year. Many of these were workers at the newly built Lysat Steelworks. Hard, heavy work that changed little for 60 years. Two people working uh, over in Lysett, so he travelled there every day. You know, you'd, you'd hear them in the morning when you woke up, the clogs going down the street, clonk, clonk. <laughs> but um, it, it was important in that respect, because uh, a, lo a lot of the work was over there, the other side of the transporter. Now Newport was booming, and the transporter bridge was centre stage. But Lysart Steelworks felt short-changed. They hadn't bargained on their 3,000 workers paying bridge tolls, so they sued the council and won. Now their workers travelled across the transporter for free, and so did the local kids, but underneath. Often we'd find ourselves below the bridge at water's edge where the boys used to go in to swim and then they'd catch hold of the bottom of the gondola and have a ride across the river. When it was very hot we'd uh, hang from it and drop into the river when the tide was up, <laughs> have a swim. You couldn't afford to do anything else, the river was free. We didn't have the money to go up to Will and uh, Stowell Bars and pay to go in there. They chase us away whenever they could, but we'd be watching, and as uh, soon as he moved off, we'd be on <laughs> and drop. Around 200,000 people a year were crossing the river on the transporter, many to visit Pill's main open space, Coronation Park. It was packed with families enjoying their Sundays and bank holidays. For young Jim Evans, it led to a meeting that would change his life forever. My mother used to make ice cream, and she used to make the ice cream and then take it over to Coronation Park and sell it. And I think that's how she met him, really. I think that's why she went there. <laughs> I think it was six and one and half a dozen of the other, to be honest, yeah. yeah. Because um, he was a good-looking man, yes, and my mother was... Quite good too. It was often Jim's job to collect the tolls. A penny for foot passengers, fourpence for vehicles, and sixpence to go across the top. He was very proud of his job, you know. He, well, he lived for his job. I mean, years after, when he finished work, he always went down to see that it was still there. 
<laughs> and he used to take one of the grandchildren on the crossbar, you know, go down and see my bridge. But by the 20s, despite plenty of users, the transporter was already costing the council thousands each year. Bridge worker Ernest Waggett's health was failing, but with a wife and ten children to support, he couldn't afford to stay home. He collapsed going over the top of the bridge, the walkway, and she said, they'll never know how we came down the bottom of the steps. Ernest died later that day in hospital. Hundreds attended his funeral. To die at 46 and leave 10 children, it takes a bit of doing to bring them up. And we were, we were all brought up. Then, of course, times were hard. The corporation, every department collected because it was a hardship case and they collected £200 in 1924. That was a lot of money. The 30s brought the Depression. Men queued outside the steelworks hoping for work. Numbers using the bridge plummeted. Times were hard, so pleasures were all the more treasured. They were great carnivals in Newport years ago. You get um, people walking with these big heads and all dressed up like that, you know. And I myself and my sister took part in the carnival. I was Miss Burma and my sister was Miss Romania. And um, we used to pay, I think, two and six for the costumes to be on these, um, on these floats. Felt very proud being there, you know. It was the highlight of the year. It really was something to look forward to, you know. Soon, peacetime was shattered. Some of the bombs fell by the transporter and by the steelworks that was there. And you always tell the sound of the German planes, the throb of the engines, the thump of the diesel. And uh, you just wondered, would he go over or would he drop something on the way? And when they did come down, you heard them because you could hear the whistle. A German map of Newport was discovered in a bomber shot down nearby. It showed the steelworks as the prime target and the transporter bridge as the bomber's marker. It was 10.30 at night, closing time, and he hit the dock hotel and killed everybody in there, I think it was. But the thing I remember, which was terrible, was the next morning in the Hearst, they had like canvas around the bodies and they were all squashed into the Hearst. Then they had them on top of the Hearst, strapped it, and they were taking them away all the... And it was, I never forgot that. It was a terrible sight. The bridge was vital, not just as a guide for the German bombers. The transporter ferried the town's workers over to Lysertz to make the steel for the Anderson shelters, a feature at the bottom of most Newport gardens. But he came down right, you know, low by the transporter could see the marks and see the gunners and everything in the darn thing. We weren't supposed to be looking, but out we went. <laughs> and they were worrying times for newlyweds, Wynne and David Lewis. He was guarding the docks, that was part of his job. And uh, he used to climb over the top of the transporter. That was part of, uh, part of, the, of the guard, you know of his patrol and uh, it must have been very frightening especially in the night time you know and because that time it was blackouts and black curtains and everything like that don't show that light the Ed Hayden Ray Borden would call out that you know they were going round the transporter survived the war and in the 50s became even more popular as tolls were scrapped on the east bank was the steel workers club with one of the best dance floors in Wales. Everything was in it was driving. 
it was all driving and that was the era for it. Um, it was exciting because there were so many new faces, you would go from one side of the town and then you would have people from Lizwery, which was just down the road there, and you were meeting new friends all the time. Let's go to the hop. Let's go to the hop. Oh, well, uh, these were what they called a penny up. And uh, you had national service then, I actually missed that. You knew you'd go there, you see all the boys coming home from national service, or been in Cyprus, or bronze, or uniform, and they'd just be standing in the door, and you, you knew there was going to be murder, because it's all fit, they'd done six months heavy training, like, and you knew they'd just be there, you know, trying to pitch your girlfriend or whatever, and you never, like, I'm not going to fight you, you've done six months service, like, you know. Thousands more were using the bridge. The river bank was buzzing. It was like a big party, you'd have hundred kids all swimming, you know, we'll, you know, take your sandwiches down and bottle of pop or something like that. It was the bridge's golden era, Weekend saw it packed, with people from miles around flocking to Coronation Park to watch the baseball. You'd all be sat on a bridge together shouting, oh, we're going to hammer you today, we're going to do this, do that. And you'd go in a park, set up your bases, and people would be arriving to watch the games. It was like England playing Germany, you know, people really got hyped up, you know, and it was the same, in, same with that, you know. Then the cameras came to town. I was just a kid, but I remember seeing the bridge for the first time. I'd never seen anything like it. It was like a prehistoric creature. We set up camp right opposite at the back of the Waterloo pub. I seemed to remember it creating quite a stir. Me and my mate Teddy, I always remember it, um, he had done me a Tony Curtis hairstyle. He, he could do hair good like... I know a wonderful place to hide. Quite near here. Up in the hills. We went there for last year's outing. I lost me Wellington in the stream. You know, just walked up to him and said, hello, you Whaley Mills, and that was it. Shook her hands, and I think somebody came up and took her away, and that was it. I didn't wash my hands for about a fortnight. Why did you lie? Lie to me. Why do you always lie? I wouldn't if you didn't shout at me. I could see a little girl with a coat all round her, because it was pretty cold. So I went over to her and said, excuse me, he said, I, are you Haley? Haley Mills? She said, yes, you know. We had a long chat, you know, and I said, well, I know your dad. Oh, you, you've met him? I said, no, I know him through watching films. But, uh, and we talked for about 10 minutes. And then one of the uh, men on the bridge, I think he was to do with the film company, he said, Timo, he said, excuse me, are, are you uh, with the crew? I said, no. I said, uh, I have to, oh yeah, well, have you finished now? Only we want to start filming. This is one of my favourite scenes. A breeze blew the tiny piece of confetti that Bronica picked out of Gilly's hair onto the guardrail of the bridge, connecting them forever. There was a little bit of poetic licence too. He gets on the bridge in Newport, he gets off in Cardiff. But the 60s weren't so kind to the transporter. A new river crossing, George Street Bridge, was open to cope with the extra traffic generated by the town's huge new steelworks at Llanwern. The fresh age of steel in Newport created 6,000 new jobs. The town boomed, attracting workers from across the world. Eunice's family arrived from Barbados when she was 10. My bedroom was at the front of the house and as I looked out there were railway lines that the old freight trains, coal wagons etc used to go along on and across from that was a transporter bridge. You knew when the bridge was moving because you would actually hear clang and you could hear like the chug of the engine room. So thinking about it I can always remember after a while I got used to it but at first it was strange. I mean, the most songs I'd heard that night would be songs of animals, sheep or cow and pigs. And all of a sudden there's all these mechanical songs <laughs> that I was going to bed to and waking up to. The 70s saw the transporter bridge's community of Pill change forever. 
as rundown streets were demolished and people rehoused. Oh, it, it destroyed it because they moved them out to all these new estates and yet they all lost contact. Everybody knew everybody around, but not anymore. As Pill was rebuilt, passenger numbers on the transporter continued to slump. But one traveller remained loyal, a little dog called Bob. He was a very clever dog, Bob. He'd have, have his routine, he'd see the bridge over and he'd, he'd go through the outer gates, his bars, he could get through there and he'd sit on the buffer. And as, as the bridge came in, the conductor opened the gate, put the pin in, before anyone got off, Bob was on. And he'd go and sit at the other end of the bridge by the, by the gates to go off. So when they got to the other side, the conductor would open the gate, trying to keep Bob back. As soon as the pin went in, Bob was gone through the gates before they would even open. And he was, well, that was it, till he was ready to come back. In 1981, the transporter celebrated her 75th birthday, but there were fewer and fewer cars crossing, just over 5,000 a year. All the time, maintenance costs were rising, and as people celebrated, rumours flew of dismantling the bridge and selling it to an American. Then one young journalist on the local paper caused a storm. Newport's most famous landmark, the Transporter Bridge, is 75 years old this year. So let's celebrate in style and then scrap it. Gosh, did I really do that? Did I really mean that? The poor old council, they were really struggling. They didn't know what to do with the Transporter Bridge. Uh, it was taking up a fair whack of their money and they were wondering uh, if they could spend it elsewhere and they really wanted to know what the people in Newport felt about the Transporter Bridge. So me, being a young, callow youth and thinking, well, I'll have a go at this, let's spark off a bit of opinion here, I thought, well, why not put forward the argument that it's a waste of time and we'll just knock it down. And that's what happened, basically. Got it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I couldn't understand. I thought it was a shame because an another one would never be built. They could, wouldn't build another one like it. That's, that was the point. Well, I don't think I was very popular. I think, um, yeah, pretty much it was probably about 100 to 1 against the idea, which uh, ultimately, I think, was what the council were looking for. I think they wanted some reassurance that the people in Newport were willing to back the transporter bridge where it counted, which was basically in the pocket. So the bridge was safe, for now. It dominated the Newport skyline thanks to 1,600 gleaming new light bulbs. Everywhere you see a cliff, right up here, we had a light bulb. That's, and when I took them off, we left the clips in situ. We just pulled them aside to get the light bulbs out. The old festoon cable itself. Because the intention was to put them back on. But the children in pill, the air guns, they were fascinated and they used to shoot them out. And the one boy, I know him now, he's about what, 30 or now, married. And uh, we come around the one day and said, what the heck are you doing? Oh, he said, we're always shooting the light bulbs out, man. I said, huh? He said, yeah, the council got a machine for putting them in. I said, yeah, you're looking at it. <laughs> and it really was Billy who changed all those light bulbs. But one night in 1984, it wasn't just the bulbs under assault. Around a hundred striking miners hijacked the bridge. They were on effort about five hours before the peace. Um, they barricaded themselves in the motor house. You know, so the police had to break into the motor house. Miners had occupied an antique transporter bridge across the river Usk effectively preventing coal ships from coming up river. But the barbed wire barricades and the hail of missiles didn't stop the police from regaining control and arresting 39 striking miners. But I think it was just a diversionary measure because of the same night they took over the cranes in Port Talbot steelworks. So uh, that was, there they could actually achieve something. Here they couldn't really. Just months later, 
the bridge was brought to a halt again, this time on safety grounds. The years had taken their toll. Cables were rusty and fraying and needed replacing. It would cost three million pounds. Then, ten years later, in 1995, it proudly reopened as a Grade I listed structure. And the Friends of the Transporter Bridge was formed to safeguard its future. In fact, I'm very proud to be a lifelong member myself. Meanwhile, life goes on beneath the bridge. Workers still cross the river to have their morning fry-ups. Oh, it's just amazing. A big sculpture like that, a big thing like that. It used to, it used to fascinate me. It still do now, to see something that, like that working still. It still fascinates me now. When I was a young kid, that would be the landmark to get on because I could see the bridge practically from all, all corners of Newport. And I know if I could see the bridge, I'm not far from home. <laughs> and, and if I went to town with my dad and I thought to myself, I got lost, well, I'd look at the bridge and I'd say, well, if I follow the direction, that will lead me home. <laughs> the bridge holds so many memories Many hadn't taken a transport a ride for decades, and they came back to reminisce on her hundredth birthday. It's so exciting. It's years since I've been over here. Years. Yes. I can't believe it. I can't believe that I'm here. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Wait till her father wasn't looking <laughs> and then dive underneath and hang on until we got to the middle, then drop off and swim to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> and then play an hour give you a lot of you know? No wonder he was always back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> It's been about 35 years since I've been on here, and um, yeah, good fun memories, you know. That fetches old, that fetches back old memories, you know, of the park and jumping on a tree on a rope and sliding down, and my hands were burning, going over the water and trying to get the pain away. Well, yeah, just good, good memories. Good. It's a long time since I've sat on this bridge and it's actually quite nice, quite nice to sit back and remember. You don't really appreciate what you have as a child until you get older and you realise it's not there for your children or possibly your grandchildren. At 100 years on, it's business as usual for our trusty transporter. More bridges now span the River Ask in Newport, but the transporter still takes pride of place and is quite rightly one of Wales' top tourist attractions. And long may she live. Well, I think, uh... So there you have it. The Transporter Bridge is 100 years old today. Happy birthday, old girl. Uncover the empire that indulged in luxury and excelled at strategy.